raunchy, controversial, and oh so funny. And add huge 76ers fan to describe Philly-born comedian Big J Okerson, who sees humor in so many things. Jay, is sex one of those things that's always going to be funny? Yeah, for sure. Because, uh, well, you know, first of all, it's such a ridiculous act for the way we conduct the rest of our lives. <laughs> Even Jay's sex life was material for another Philly comic, his good friend, Kevin Hart. We'll talk about that and so much more with Big Jay Okerson on Fresh 24. Big J. Okerson, Philly guy, West Philly guy, South Jersey guy, podcast, yes, radio host, comedian, funny mofo, Sixers fan. Is this the life you envisioned for yourself back in the day? Uh, it's why I didn't envision anything, which actually became a problem when I hit my mid-30s and was broke still. <laughs> it, it, it was going to all smack me at once that... Uh, that I wasn't doing great yet. It took a while. It took a while for me to kind of break through and pop. Why do you think it uh, took a while? I think because I kind of didn't compromise like what my type of humor is. And I know it's not for everybody. It's not a mainstream thing necessarily. So I think it take, you have to really build your audience if you're going to do that. And that's not my, my gift isn't that like the gathering people and social media and all that kind of stuff. That's not my talent. So I was able to kind of do what I do and just had to wait kind of for the people to catch on and enough people to catch on and also the help from other people. But it sounds like it was comedy all along as opposed to, do I be a fireman or an attorney? You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I figured it out at 19. At 19, a friend of mine uh, suggested, who was someone who I lost touch with. I, I switched schools my senior year of high school and a friend of mine, she uh, moved to South Jersey also like about a year later. And then we caught up like a year after high school and she was like, uh, she was just kind of saying she was disappointed that I never tried comedy. She always thought I would have tried it because I was such a fan of it. And then I happened to, I didn't even know that that laugh house on South Street existed at the time. Wow. And uh, I just happened by it the next day and then I saw the open mic sign and I started giving it a shot. Well, I chickened out the first five times, but or four times. And then the fifth time I brought friends so I would have to go on. So tell me about the fifth time, which was your first time actually doing something live. What was the vibe? Um, it was, well, so it was the Laugh House Comedy Club on South Street. It was, at the time, it had become a, a what they would call an urban club, <laughs> uh, which is the polite way for some reason of saying black club. I don't know why that's mean, but it was. We were, uh, me and another comedian, Kurt Metzger, were pretty much the two white guys in there. But it was... It was fantastic. When I went in, the energy was so good. The first four weeks that I went and chickened out, it was because I couldn't believe how good everyone was doing. Like, they were up there very confident and comfortable. I've only seen comedy at that point on the highest level, not highest level, but television level, you know, whether it be showcases or whatever on uh, A&E. And uh, I went and watched, and I couldn't believe how impressive they were the fifth week i finally uh that the fourth week was my worst chicken out because the host to ray gordon who's a philly a philly legend at this point to ray uh he called my name anyway even though i told him i wasn't going to go up and he called and he kept trying to get me to come on stage and i was just shaking my head no in the back chickening out and then the next week i brought friends so i would feel kind of like uh obligated to go on i went on the jokes I mean, we're terrible, I'd have to assume, but it, I got through it and the crowd laughed and I thought that I had done a mate. Like at the time, it seemed like I might as well have just brought the house down is how good it went because I couldn't believe they gave any of the reactions I was looking for. And uh, I dropped out of Camden County Community College the next day. 
The very next day. The very next day to dedicate my life to open mic on Thursdays. What were you doing at Camden County Community? Uh, never mind. I, I don't nothing. need to know. It's, it's past, and I know that there you're was not also going nothing. Back. Yeah, yeah, right. There was really. I, I went for the most basic of prerequisites, and then just as soon as I had an excuse to get out of there, you know, it, it took many years later. I did a podcast with Burt Kreischer, and um, you know, it's funny you tell a story so long it takes somebody else giving you the perspective change that like lets you realize how dumb you've sounded all these years. Cause I mm. always tell the story that, you know, I dropped out of college and then my mom and stepfather, you know, essentially kicked me out, you know, for a, for a whole week. I went mm. and stayed at Kevin Hart's house, actually his apartment. And uh, a week later I came back and I told Bert how I'd given him this speech about how I'm a, you know, I'm, a, I'm such a quitter by nature. And I, I know if this gets difficult, I'll just quit if it gets, if I have like, you know, my eggs and other baskets. So I got to kind of put it all into here. And if it fails and I can always go back to school and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Burt Kreischer started laughing hysterically and just goes, you could have done both. And it just, it was funny. It was like coming out of a stupor, drunken stupor. Everything (laughs) becomes clear. I'm like, oh yeah, I absolutely could have done both. I just didn't like college. I see it happening with my daughter now who just, you know, it's like a million reasons why, not college right now. It's like, you just hate school. So did I. I get how, it. How old is she, by the way? She's 20. Wow. Okay. We'll get into that. And you mentioned Kevin Hart. We're going to talk about him as well. Uh, so where did you graduate? You said you, you you changed high schools in your senior year. Did you graduate yeah. from Lamberton? No. So I went to Lamberton for 11 years, <laughs> kindergarten oh, wow. through 11th grade. Huh. And then uh, we moved to South Jersey. I graduated from Triton High School in uh, in running me New Jersey. Got it. Were, were you the class crack up as a kid? No, amongst my friends, I was because my comedy was much more conversational or I would inflect or inject a comedy into, you know, if we had to write papers or something or English assignments and stuff. No, I was never like the fart noise under the armpit or the <laughs> throw something at the teacher or be loud. Also, because I was very afraid of like the failure of funny like trying and not like I wasn't popular enough that like if I did it it was just going to get a laugh from the cronies you know it's like I was like if this doesn't make the cooler kids laugh I'm gonna look like an ass yeah, so right. no I was kind of like I was a little more reserved and as far as class clown no one would have ever judged me as that so we see you're repping the Sixers with your cap uh, what's oh, your yeah. earliest Sixer memory the year that I got into it, my stepfather came into our lives when I was about 10 years old and he was just like like sports kind of generally. Um, and then we started seeing, I just loved the, the pace of the game. It was a game that I know I can kind of go outside and just start playing. There was a lot of basketball courts around. And then uh, so it was the team of, I think the, fir- the, the, the beginning stars that I had to root for is so funny because they never had a franchise guy for, for many years, uh, kind of before and after Iverson. And so I remember the... Uh, I think the first one was Hersey Hawkins. Dana Barros, I believe, was the star. He was so like was the Barkley guy. still was Barkley? Oh, Barkley I wasn't think there. Barkley at that point. had. I think it was Barkley's like last year. I kind of got involved, okay. and then he went okay. to the Suns right away. I believe, right? Right. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, yeah, it was kind of like you know those years. I remember playing video games and having to really get behind Clarence Weatherspoon, <laughs> Kenny Payne, people like that. <laughs> oh yeah, um, Tim Perry. Right. Uh, all Andrew those guys. Lang. But, and I loved them. Like, I just loved the game. The, the wow. movement of the game was so fun to me. And like, even now when I go, I have such a uh, appreciation. Me and my girlfriend and daughter watched a couple years ago, J.J. Reddick. I'm pretty friendly with uh, Matt Cord. Yeah. And he'll have me come down. Like, when I show up to the arena, he'll let me go down, stand with him while they shoot around the beginning of the game. And just the skill level of like a J.J. Redick just bouncing two balls with his hands and then banging like 25 three-pointers in a row effortlessly. I've just – it's one of those things I've never felt like I've been as good as anything as the worst player on the team is at basketball. It's such a skill and such a beautiful sport. So I just like really fell in love with it. And then the stack house first year was uh, exciting because you were like, oh, we got somebody who they're saying is a star. I don't follow college sports at all. So I basically get the rundown from a friend of who's you should be excited about. 
and then I get excited about them. And my friend Glenn uh, loved Iverson at Georgetown, and he would mm. have us watch his highlights and everything. And then we went to the what was it? What they before they finished it was Core State Center. Before they had finished it, they let people come in who, if you could just say you were thinking about getting season tickets, and they would let you go <laughs> to like basically the empty, still not finished yet arena. But they let everybody kind of go inside, and it may have been Pat Croce came on the screen uh, about three minutes before the draft went live, and he told the audience that they were going to draft Iverson. So I remember that moment being like pretty, pretty big because he – I mean, went on to become one of my two favorite athletes of all time. Where does that 2001 season fit into your Sixer fandom? It was so great. I would use it as an example of uh, how white trash uh, my family is at heart. Was We moved to South Jersey to move into a townhouse, no more apartment living. My uh, mom and stepfather both had good jobs now at this point. They both finished college and they had – uh, both had good jobs. We lived in a nice neighborhood and we had, we still had an Allen Iverson poster tacked up in our living room <laughs> <laughs> for that season. <laughs> My mom didn't find that strange, but that see that those playoffs, it was funny. I'd started doing comedy already, but like just barely, I was still hanging out with a lot of my friends kind of locally. And we were so excited for that. Uh, you know, I think almost every series went to a game seven, if not every series. Mm. Or, or it, mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. they all seven mm-hmm. steps? Seven went, or f- been five. So, yeah. Well, not, uh, yeah, the first the first round was a best of five, and they won it in four. And then the finals, of course, ended in five. But that was yeah. the best of seven. But, yeah, Toronto, certainly, and Milwaukee, they were both epic series. They were. And then uh, for the finals, me and my friends in the neighborhood – got a big you know who who was having a bed sheet they were going to throw away and we made a big scoreboard for like you know game to game and go out and you'd put an x in the win or loss for the series and uh that first day going out that 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 overtime uh game the way iverson played and the step over and and the whole thing was so to go out there and put that first x in the win column and right. then I think by loss three in a row after that, mm-hmm. <laughs> we stopped going out. We just let the sheet die in the wind. <laughs> We're like, this isn't looking good, gang. <laughs> Where does Iverson fit into your lexicon of uh, favorite players of all time? F- favorite uh, NBA player, like bar none of all time. He, he was just, I said, it's a person who I've never had the pleasure of really getting to know or meet even really. Uh, I passed by him in not meeting, but like, you know, like a pass by each other in situations, maybe two or three times while he was still an active player and circumstantially to no fault of his own. It just wasn't very friendly or, you know, it was just like a guy on the street saying, and I get it. Mm -hmm. Um, never had that opportunity, but I always wanted to like, thank him. I get emotional weird at very strange things, especially with my schedule and the way, uh, like the stress and kind of whatever of my life uh, with the travel and again, and the years also of not making any kind of money and being concerned. Uh, 82 Sixers games is like, was my, is still my escape. I don't <laughs> think about anything. I have no input. There's no input being looked for for me. It's just a, I can completely escape into it. And I, I have such an emotional like attachment to that, like the appreciation for that, that, uh, that's what I always wanted to kind of give Iverson. I'm like, man, you brought me without even a championship. Every year was just so fun. You know, every every year completely just something. You know what I mean? Like he just had a games, legendary games. I had a chance to one of the very few. Actually, I think of po- for positive things, I think it might be the only Philly sports legendary moment I happened to be there for was my buddy's mom was dating a lawyer in Philadelphia and he was still trying to impress her. So he gave me and uh, her son tickets to go see the Bulls Sixers Iverson's rookie year. And it was, we were sitting row 15 half court for the crossover. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the moment that, that was such a cool thing to have been there for. Right. Even though they end up losing the game and they're yeah. a, a really bad team. Uh, well, what's besides, your me, on- besides, besides that, I, I paid, inordinate amounts of money to go sit in a phenomenal almost courtside seat to watch ben simmons not dunk the ball in game seven against (laughs) atlanta 
<laughs> what's your what's your what's your take on him? I know that there are a lot of uh, I just had uh, T.J. McConnell on who kind of defended Ben Simmons. Of course, he is a player, but he claims behind the scenes he worked hard. He did everything he could. You know, there is the issue of mental illness and how people treat that as opposed to a broken leg or a bad knee or something like that. What's your take on Ben? Uh, look, it's disappointing what he's done. I think he's, you know, clearly a high level uh, athlete for sure. He, what it looks to me like, and this is all speculation, just by the way he does it. I feel like he was a guy driven into sports by a father who wanted him to play sports. Hmm. I think I see that with Zion Williamson too, a similar kind of thing. With maybe it's not a father, but I think with Ben Simmons, it's a father. Uh, Zion, I don't know, but it's just this a world they were expected to be in that they don't really care. I don't think Ben Simmons loves it. Mm. I don't think he loves the, uh, you know, I used to make a, uh, a correlation almost to what I said about how, you know, the, the, the furthest back bench player on the NBA looks like a, uh, like an elite high level athlete. If he goes to any like good gym, even where they're playing basketball, they're so good. And there's something, the mental thing, when Iguodala was our number one guy for a while there, the Drew Holiday's first years, and it was Iguodala's mm-hmm, team mm-hmm. essentially for after Iverson left. When I, I feel like when you'd see Iguodala get upset, uh, you know, he doesn't like the way the game's going or he took a hard foul and didn't get called, he can go down the floor the next seven times and dunk the ball over the entire team. Mm. Effortlessly almost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's because he went into a different place mentally, like almost whatever you call it, a zone or – or just like, you know, his, he got ab- upset and it was like, I'm just going to do this thing. But the walking around energy, I used to say that the only difference between like a Kobe Bryant and uh, and an Andre Iguodala is that Kobe Bryant knows he's Kobe Bryant and Andre Iguodala doesn't think he's Kobe Bryant. <laughs> so, because on a, on a pure skill level of shooting a ball and dribbling, and go, there, I mean, it's got to be so close. It's a matter mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm. you know, again, the personality of, Ben Simmons not taking that dunk. Joel Embiid will not pass to an open guy and crank it from half court if there's a couple seconds left if he just – and then he'll walk off the court with like a, well, someone's got to shoot it, man. Mm-hmm. You know, and like he doesn't yeah, – right. I don't think he wears that half court miss for the rest of his uh, year or the rest of the day even. He's like, you know, someone's got to take that shot. I'll take it. <clears throat> and that's impressive. But, um, yeah, it was, Can you know – I think Iverson kind of had that thing too. Like he would just go do it. Can the Sixers uh, win a title with Joel? Yeah, I think they sure can. I just don't know what. I don't know what they have to put around them exactly. You know, I'm not sure what the. Uh, I also have a. It's so weird. I've never been in a locker room like that or worked in a team setting like that to understand the idea that like. How do you like work with somebody? Like when Ben Simmons had the whole thing happen, it's like, well, how's he going to come back to the team? You know what I mean? Like the team's already, there's been things said in the press. There's these awkward moments. Same thing with James Harden. It's like James Harden's done with Philadelphia. Now if he stays and ends up playing, it's like, there's like a weird uh, vibe. Yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, I guess we convinced him to stay or something. And that's, right. that's strange. Yeah, right. So like, I I'm not really sure what the uh, – Joel Embiid, I guess they just – I just read a thing this morning that he – he's like, you know, if it's in Philadelphia or wherever it is, I want to win a title. And you're like, oh, that's not good first talk. <laughs> that's not a – Yeah, it, and, and it amazes me, you know, in this day and age with the internet, uh, an athlete just can say something like as half a thought and, you know, it suddenly becomes headline material yeah. for the next few days. But listen, uh, enough Sixer talk. We, we could talk about the Sixers for not hours. Uh, but uh, – uh, what I do want to do is get into your career, but before that, I want to do what we call our halftime segment. And basically, I'm going to give you a choice between two things and you blurt out the answer. Don't overthink it. All right. Okay. You ready? Yep. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation. PHL Sports Nation. Enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. All right, it'll be quick. Here you go. Coffee or tea? Tea. Blue or red? Blue. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Rock or rap? Rock. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. 
Hot or cold? Cold. Plain or peanuts? Plain. New school or old school? Old school. Thick or thin? Who? <laughs> thick. <laughs> thick. Oh. Thick on that one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Into my music library. I'm going to give you a handful of artists from my music library. You tell me if you have them in your music library. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Some of my selections might surprise you. Future. No. Isley Brothers. Yes. Led Zeppelin. Yes. Marcus Miller. Nope. Rascal Flats. Nope. All right. Two out of five. <laughs> Future's, Future's a, uh, a rapper, by the way. Yeah, no, I know. I have a 20-year-old yeah. daughter. I know yeah, all right. the rappers. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sure I have nothing that's in her collection, but that's neither here nor there. I've officially right. hit the thing of saying the uh, the old man stuff. Like, ah, this isn't a... Oh, look at you. you know, oh, how slick, old are you? Slick Rick. <laughs> how um, old are you? I'm 45. Yeah, I got underworlder than you, okay? <laughs> 40, 45 is not that old. All right. I'm going to get into your career. I'm going to quote a New York Times article on you. I'm, I'm amazed you were in the New York Times. So that's pretty cool. Uh, 2014, it described you as having, quote, a therapist knack for putting people at ease and a comedian's gift for making them uncomfortable. You're a master at the ancient art of the dirty joke. If he isn't the filthiest comic in New York, he certainly looks the part. A big lug with arm tattoos, fingerless gloves, and a pocket chain that hangs by his thigh. Not since Sam Kinison roared as a comic appeared more heavy metal. I'm going to get into some of your work. Let's take a uh, listen to a cut from your 2023 Dog Belly special. How old are you? 21. That's so young. Do you like this kind of comedy? His parents brought you? That is weird. <laughs> really? You came with your folks to Vegas? Are you sharing a room with them? Are you in an adjacent room with them? They don't want to hear your guys' weird Wiccan fucking. <laughs> you think your parents are banging here in town? Definitely. Definitely. How old are they? 50? Yeah, probably. Vegas fucking too. You don't want to think about it? Let me describe it for you. Your mom, still limber for her age, holding her ankles head down hard. Your dad giving her the biz from behind. It's good, because your mom's bent over so much that her puss is just a perfect line right in front of him. She still got it, your mom. And then your dad's got his hands on the window, looking at the luck somewhere in the distance going, I'm the king of the world, dude. P.S. They both did coke. That's right, your mom <laughs> did coke off your dad's dick tonight. But it's Vegas. <laughs> Jay, is sex one of those things that's always going to be funny? Yeah, for sure. Because, uh, well, you know, first of all, it's such a ridiculous act for the way we conduct the rest of our lives. <laughs> Just and then the sex vibe is totally different. Yeah, like the way people see you walking around during the day. I've been saying that on stage lately, too. I'm like, for every uh, woman you've ever met who's yelling at you at the DMV line or a, a mean waitress or manager somewhere, she's got some very vulnerable picture in her phone of her, like, pulling her butt cheeks apart or something. <laughs> I'm like, it really is just that because it's, it's, uh, it's the most vulnerable. It's the most vulnerable you are and the most different from your personality most times. I mean, I've tried to inject funny things. I've learned over the years, like, no one likes that. No one likes when you're being funny during sex at all. <laughs> but so almost in that, you have to – it's probably the point, part of your life where you play a character most in also, whether it's just holding back anything. I mean, the immediate – the immediacy of whatever I've said or done in the past 15, 20 minutes sexually 
as soon as it's over and you lay back, if you reflect upon it, you're like, what did I say? <laughs> or what I did mean, I do? Yeah, I don't mean that. <laughs> How was I positioned? No, don't tell my friends. <laughs> it's like it either taps into another side of your brain or just like, you know, I don't know, shuts off your rational thought altogether. It really does. It really is. Yeah, it's the most. Uh, and we all kind of have it the same. You know, like even turning off the idea of, you know, historically what I've met, like women that I've uh, hooked up with at all, it's like through comedy clubs. And there has to be like a switch shut off. Like you're supposed to be funny up until the whole moment. And then it's, you're supposed to start passionately kissing. <laughs> it seems right, like a weird right. break. Do, do women hit on you like they're attracted to comedians? They think you're funny, you're witty, and it becomes an attraction for them? Yeah, sometimes. Unfortunately, most of the time they look like me. But the, <laughs> on the rare occasions, <laughs> on the rare occasions, it's, uh, there's a, yeah, for sure. I've definitely uh, been out of my league before because of just being funny, I think. Wow, wow. I'm so um, insecure, but I, I think some, something in like the being funny reads differently. Like I've had, it's funny, I've, I've hooked up before a lot, a couple times of like kind of one-off experiences because I looked like I was playing it cool. And then the second they were like, well, I like you, I just fell apart and I'm, you know, then I'm the over texting and like, right. for sure, like you sure you really do? Like you actually do like me and like, not anymore. It's By the over. way, we're all, we're all insecure on various levels, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, let me play another segment from one of your stand-up appearances talking about Fem feminism eroding manhood. We gotta take the night back, fellas. That's what it is. This is your girlfriend, your wife? Almost wife. Almost wife. Fiance. Nice. I like you didn't say that, though. <laughs> Claim your manhood. Do you respect him? Not anymore. Not anymore? Really? <laughs> Just like that. All oh, that shit, man. Watch out for it. It's all the subtle, like, you ever ask a guy to do something and he's like, let me ask the boss or some shit like that? We're giving them too much. Start telling them what's wrong with them, fellas. That's what it is. We don't do it. You want to see confusion on a woman's face? You've been together six years. Do you know how many times this guy's had to slap toilet paper crumbs out of the crack of your pussy, never said a word to you about it? <laughs> never says a word. He just slaps them away. And you're looking back like kinky. And he's like, okay. <laughs> just slapping away. So a number of things to talk about from this segment. First, being raunchy. Does being raunchy carry a double-edged sword? Because, you know, for some it might be hilarious, and for some people it's, uh, you know, they could do without it. No, for sure. You know, and I don't have, uh, I don't have an ego or a, if you can't handle it kind of personality. I've never been a big fan of that. Like, oh, you guys can't handle it. I'm like, it's just not some people's thing. You know, my grandmother passed about a, a year and a half ago. And, it, you know, I love my grandmother dearly. She thought I was hilarious as a person. I didn't show her any of my stand up. It's not her kind of thing, but it doesn't change like her love for me or she, she doesn't not know the person I am. It just is. So I've learned over time to not even take that personally. I do find it strange when uh, I've had people and I've, this conversation I'm almost done trying to have in person because it's just, it's made me lose my faith in adulthood because I've had 65 year old, 60 year old women or men wait in line, a meet and greet line where people are so excited to meet me and sign things. And they've been fans for a long time. They'll wait right behind that to come up to me and be like, you should change what you do. <laughs> like you're funny, but like it doesn't have to be so dirty and I've tried to have the rational conversation of, oh, no, I get it. Like, it's for sure. It's not for everybody. I fully understand that. I was like, but, you know, you just got to research the comic you're going to go see. You know, there's plenty of comics. And I remember telling this one lady in that happened in Seattle. And I said, uh, Gary Goldman, who's a brilliant comic, is uh, performing across town at this other comedy club. I know we flew out here on the same plane. He's pretty clean and he's lights out hilarious you know and she was like well i like coming to this place like that was her <laughs> argument against i should change what it is I, i'm like so to, you can never wrap your brain around the idea of someone thinking whether you did well in a room 
and everyone seemed to enjoy it and there's a lot of fans there they're like yeah but that's not my thing so can you change i i i, I always liken it to I don't love romantic comedies. I've never written a letter saying, stop making these. <laughs> I just assume I'm not the audience for it. There is an audience for it, and they'll go see it. But it is funny how, like, personal people will take things. You know, even when we get the the flack for being, quote, unquote, offensive or whatever, just kind of going for it with jokes, um, it's very hard to defend humor because they they accuse you of things that are just clearly not true. You know, I said I've been called – it's puzzling how many times I've been called a Nazi and I'm mm. Jewish, mm. which is crazy. Now mm -hmm. I'll make Jewish jokes and I'll make Nazi jokes and whatever. The th it, it doesn't matter because it's all jokes is the point of that. It's not really a, a personal thing, but it's when someone takes it personal, they're taking a joke you said and then assigning you something so vicious one to, to put out there in the world about somebody. Like it's clear that I'm making a joke on a comedy show when they come back and they're like you're a nazi you're a racist a misogyny all these things like that's actually a damaging hurtful thing they're trying to do mm -hmm. so when will smith slaps chris rock is that a slap at all comedians that the only honest to god my only problem with that i thought it was such an awesome moment in entertainment to that <laughs> happen and i could not believe and i've been on record saying this a while i mean chris rock you can't take anything away from that career you know he's He's done amazing. He's brilliant. He'll always be like on uh, people's Mount Rushmore of comedy. The fact that he didn't respond to that in a funny way, at least even that night, was a mind blow to me. And then I think what he did in the special was a little too little too late. And, you know, Howard Stern kind of put this pretty eloquently, and I agree with him because I've seen it happen watching Chris Rock in the last uh, two years. It's... Something about even if you're the like twerpiest comic on stage and your comedy is self-deprecating and it's whatever, there's still some element of you that is controlling the room. And that's the the bigger than life element. You're controlling it. If someone gets nasty with you and they're bigger and scarier than you, you could probably chop them down with your words still. You know, like you can mm -hmm, mm -hmm. an ownership. It's mm -hmm. not like you can kick everyone's ass, but at least like in this scenario, like you can calmly be like, All right, well now they're gonna throw you out, man. You know what I mean? You're gonna be thrown outside and like you can avoid like conflict. And there's some ownership over that stage that feels like uh cool, even if you're self deprecating. It's uh and then uh, when I feel like when someone will walk up on stage and slap you and you kind of just take it, I know it's surprising for the first couple seconds. And if that's not your instincts is to be a fighter, I get it. But when they came back from the Oscars from announcing those, the nominees for the documentary he was giving, like mm -hmm. something, <laughs> like yeah, right, right. something uh, I would have accepted uh, a charging towards Will Smith, even though, you know, security's going to grab you mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. motion of like, uh, retaliation or comeback mm -hmm, in some mm -hmm, way and mm -hmm, and and mm -hmm. the words would have been the best if you would have just uncorked on uh jada pinkett at that moment anything would have saved me. i have a hard time now seeing chris rock and if he puts mm -hmm. forward anything like you know if he was like uh, mike tyson said something on his podcast shut the fuck up mike tyson you're like <laughs> oh don't say that dude don't say that chris rock you know you wouldn't have thought anything about him saying shut the fuck up mike tyson six years ago you'd have been like it's just a joke and who cares right. obviously you right. can't. but now you're like ah, you know if you piss mike tyson off enough he does know you are punchable <laughs> <laughs> um how do you know something's going to be funny when you think of it how do you know it's going to be funny it's I've, I've learned the trust that if i find it the more difficult thing is not knowing what's funny if it if i think it's funny i trust that it's funny the difficulty is how do you convey that to a masses and and make sure it like you know feel comfortable it's going to work on a broad level that's do you know what i mean like there's yeah, plenty sure. of things you think of but patrice o'neill the late great like one of the two amazing piece of advice he gave me was learn to have that the confidence to say something on stage you you know might not hit you know what he used the term might not be funny but i don't even necessarily agree that it's not funny it's like all right when i pictured it in my head like I haven't conveyed enough. I've actually taken over the years. I found there to be a lot of fun if I do say something on stage and it doesn't 
get a laugh the way I was picturing the funny in my head. I mm-hmm. always tend to think that, and I'll, I'll stop an audience and go, all right, hang on. Something went haywire there because in my head that is funny. Like, maybe <laughs> I'm not conveying it right. And then there's something fun about over detailing what I've said and explaining to them why I thought they would think it's fun. And that tends to work also, which is fun. But, um, but that is a scary thing. You know, that's something to get over again. Once you've, I don't know about all jobs, you know, that 10,000 hours, uh, mm-hmm. thing they tell you, mm-hmm. I don't know Malcolm Gladwell. what that, uh, I, I don't know like how that works across the board, but something about as through the years in comedy, I do say, I think that's what it is. You just log enough hours. Like I'm not freaked out. If I go on stage at a, large venue and the crowd doesn't laugh at like two or three things I said in a row. It doesn't shake me to my core anymore, which is, that's a big milestone to kind of hit. So it's, it's more or less like staying in the pocket and staying like comfortable and putting those 10,000 hours. Once you've experienced the, everything you could experience on stage, as we said, before we started filming, I've been yanked off stage. I've been, you mm. know, there's so many things that have happened and mm. things thrown at me and people yelling out stuff and getting super upset and wanting to fight outside and all these crazy things you get a little less apprehensive to say things on stage. Cause you're like, well, I'm probably not going to get attacked this time. <laughs> you yeah. just kind of hedge your bets that it's like, eh, this one's probably worst case scenario. The crowd's not super into it. <laughs> a, um, a story that, uh, I've told many times I'm, uh, traveling with the Sixers. I'm in uh, Washington, the four seasons I'm on a treadmill and two treadmills over is Paul McCartney. Oh, wow. And Paul, yeah. And Paul McCartney is on the treadmill and he's got his, earbuds in Mm -hmm. and you know i'm looking at him saying who the hell is he listening to (laughs) and and then i'm saying to myself well does he listen for the enjoyment or does he say oh this guy's got great chord structure and phrasing and all this other stuff who do you think is funny or maybe more accurately not necessarily making you laugh but because they have great technique or great timing or great style or something that you know about as a fellow comedian that you could share with us uh, the people who, I mean, from the, from the get, I was always a fan of Dave Attell as a comic, just from seeing him on the showcase shows on, you know, the comedy channel when it first came out or before it became comedy central or young comedian specials on HBO. I'd see Dave Attell always thought he was funny. When Keith Robinson brought me, Kevin Hart and Kurt Metzger up to New York, we'd hang at the comedy cellar and we watched, we would go downstairs and watch Dave Attell when he went on just because he was a name we recognized at all from comedy. And Mm -hmm. I mean, the first time I saw him, how my cheeks were hurting, (laughs) how impressive he was. And there is something, you know, I think Patrice also put this well too. It's once you learn someone's recipe, I don't think this works so much. Maybe it works in sports too. But once you know someone's recipe, a little of their mystery is gone. Mm. And you start to check whether you think there doesn't mean they're not good comics, some phenomenal comics. You just kind of know their recipe. So you're like, well, I kind of I don't rush to watch everything they do because I'm like, I kind of know where it'll be funny and I'll see it when I see it, you know. But um, when you can't figure out someone's recipe adds like a level of intrigue to them like that. Patrice was a great example that Patrice O'Neill is like difficult recipe to figure out once he got Mm. going and kind of like pontificating on stage like life and social commentary and stuff it really got you didn't know exactly how he was going to go with it very interesting david tell is such a machine at joke writing Hmm. and the way he goes like it's just it's never not impressive also his way to stay relevant whether it be with reference or anything i think he's just probably one of the best to ever do it dave Chappelle's obviously a genius um but i think he's getting a a little preachy and wordy now which you Mm -hmm. know Maybe mm-hmm. no fault of his, but just that's how he's kind of reacting to the the backlash he's getting. Mm-hmm. And Kurt Metzger, who I started with from the time I met him, was like a savant with just mm-hmm. joke writing. He just knows how to like uh, – he just got a unique take that I've never seen anybody else kind of have before. So, I mean, those are the – David Tell, Kurt Metzger for sure. Patrice O'Neill is unbelievable. And I said all oh, – uh, you know, I don't hang out with any – you know, it was fun. I, I used to hang out – what the time would have been considered a bunch of younger comics than me who are now veterans. And we've all been friends for quite some time, but I was always, like I said, I never like, uh, had friendships for placement or positioning. I was like, whoever makes me laugh. So 
anyone that I do my podcast with, with Dan Soder, we did the bonfire, or, uh, Louis J. Gomez and Dave Smith that we do a Legion of Skanks podcast with. These guys have made me laugh like for you. They're the funniest people to me in that regard. You know, like I just like they make me laugh depending no, no matter where they're at on stage or anything like that, which was always mm-hmm. impressive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned Kevin Hart earlier, a um, a friend of yours, obviously another Philly guy. In fact, went to my high school, George Washington. Uh-huh. And uh, he tells a story about you. Let's listen. Big J Okerson. It's a comedian friend of mine from Philadelphia that I started out with. And Big J went through this period where he was interested in swinging. And it was yeah. a true story, him and the Bible. And he convinced his girl to swing, right? He said, we should do it. And he wanted to do it because the other couple that he wanted to do it, the guy's, like, woman was, he said, like, she was she was great looking. Like, I, I want to do it because I can get to her. Like, we can, it can be great. And I was like, dude, I said, you taking a gamble? I said, that's a lot. It's aggressive, right? It's not really my cup of tea, but I don't know how people live, and I don't knock what people do with their lives, because that's your life. Big J said they swung. And he watched this guy fuck the dog shit out of his <laughs> <laughs> He never bounced back from it. If you get in there and somebody goddamn go double overtime on your lady, <laughs> you Not see him up the sweat dripping from his head <laughs> on your lady. Yeah, face. yeah, that's a lot. So is there a, I mean, is it no holds barred when you're a comedian and you could talk about anything and he's your friend and he's a comedian and he feels he could talk about anything. I mean, this is a sensitive, to my mind, it's a sensitive subject. I asked you before we recorded, can we talk about this? And you said, sure, without even blanching. Sure. So is it just okay and that's it and we move on? Um, Like a story like that? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really bother. I mean, it's, it's also from like, you know, a million years ago. He's telling okay. a story from it's you know it's a twenty three twenty five year old story mm. of a time with, with a girlfriend that I haven't been with in as long almost. But uh, no, I mean he definitely. I mean, in fairness, I've told some some Kevin stories where I've almost had to pull back. I'm like, you know what? He's actually extremely famous, and maybe I shouldn't have that story out there. You're right. You're right. <laughs> of him doing that, but Kev's pretty uh, uh an open book. You know, what I mean for sure. He's done a. Uh, and that story was, it's a funny one. Yeah, it was a, a, a first attempt at couple swapping. It was having a mm-hmm. girlfriend for a long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then another pretty girl being like, hey, me and my boyfriend do this. And then it turns out we were all just being manipulated by an older guy who had a van. <laughs> <laughs> the other girl's boyfriend was the facilitator. So I think when Kev tells that story, he even says when I came back, I was like, that wasn't what I was. I was, I was picturing just the good stuff for me and not the yeah, bad right. stuff for me. <laughs> right. um, your daughter's 20. Is she funny? Does she want to get into comedy? Or are you one of those parents who would say, yeah, it's good for me, but don't you do it? No, I was a kind of uh, either way. If she, I, I know for sure she's much more of like an artistic mind than an academic, which I can appreciate. Her mother is a lawyer. So, you know, she wanted her to be an academic uh, much more. But I see her kind of leaning more towards art. She tried comedy once when she was like 14. I put her in the comedy class. She wanted to take it and try it. And she did it. She, I don't know if this is a young thing across the board or uh, whatever, but she did not. Like, her mother also started doing comedy, by the way, when we split up, interestingly enough. So she, as she got to an age to see what was kind of going on, she was seeing me performing, not like headlining and selling out yet or anything, but at the comedy clubs in New York City on the weekends, packed, you know, some notable names on the show. She'd go there and see some people from Saturday Night Live, and and she loved that world of it. She would then go with her mother, who's starting out, you know, in her late 30s at the time, too, who's starting out and performing for five other comedians at 5 p.m. at a bar, and she was just like, when she was able to see, you know, by the time I was wrapped up in comedy and loved it, I was, I didn't know of like the grind of this and driving three hours to make $15 or, mm. or for five minutes on stage or all these like crazy things. And she was getting a look at that. And she was like, no, nah, I don't love it like that. Like she just mm-hmm, had like, the, I don't mm-hmm. love it enough to be like these waking hours of no money and terrible shows and the audience isn't there and stuff so 
I get it. <laughs> I also get it because that grind was – I loved it until I realized it was going on too long. Right, right. Jay, um, are you good where you are right now? I mean, uh, you're you're well known. You've got a legion of fans. You're 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 making a living at making people laugh, which is you know, it's almost as good as doing play by play for the Sixers. Um, That'd be a good are, are, are you good with where where you are and what you've done? Do you want more? Do you want to be you know a star of a movie or a TV show? What's your vibe? No, you know it's funny. I I've done enough television and movie stuff that. Almost like I just said about my daughter. It's not my deal, necessarily. I was in a... To show how much I don't, like, overly care about acting and stuff. It's fun when you're in something. When it comes out and you're in it is a blast. Mm -hmm. The process... I, I did a three days... I played the strip club DJ on Hustler, in the movie Hustlers with J-Lo. Within that... <clears throat> within that three days, I, uh, I, inter I introduced... Uh, j-lo for that big dance she does that can now became sort of iconic because she's 50 years old and looks like that mm. uh cardi b half naked uh lizzo before she was famous usher was on set that day uh constance Wu's thong had a hard time staying over her butthole <laughs> there were so many things uh in that and i still reflect upon the days as like three long boring days because you, in, in 14 hours a day that I was there, uh, I was needed for two, maybe one hour, maybe two hours. Like, like, it was such a small amount of time. And that's just not my thing. I love when it comes out. And I said, you're mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. look at me. You know, I took my daughter to the movies and just kept elbowing her. I'm like, eh? <laughs> Anytime I was on screen. So, no. And it's not even that I'm, I'm, I'm happy with my, like, trajectory, like, where it's going. I think... If I could tour around doing this, I love broadcasting. I love it. I like doing my podcast. I like doing the Sirius XM show. I think they are different very naturally, which is nice. They kind of, uh, I get to explore two different kind of sides of my comedy with those. It's immediate reaction, I feel like, just like stand-up comedy is. And uh, I like that. Yeah, I do. I like that I didn't kind of pop from something outside of comedy. Like anyone who's a fan of mine, is a fan of my stand-up comedy, which I, I love that. Brother, it was a real pleasure. You're a funny guy. You're awesome. Thank You're you, sir. You're a great Sixers fan. Appreciate the love. Appreciate you coming on. Good luck with your podcast and everything else, and thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Mark's pleasure. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts.